Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> welcome. Um, hello to all of our members and welcome to another webcast with the Canadian Association of Social Workers. We are so happy that you're joining us today and we're so happy that so many of you are joining uh, with us today from right across the country. So that's exciting. Uh, my name is Joan Davis Whalen. I'm the president of the Canadian Association of Social Workers and I am the vice president of the North American region of the International Federation of Social Workers. So I have the honor, and it is indeed an honor, of welcoming you, to you today to today's webinar entitled Ethical Challenges for Social Workers During COVID-19, A Global Perspective. Our speaker today is Merlinda Weinberg. Dr. Merlinda Weinberg is Professor of Social Work at Dalhousie University. So before obtaining her PhD in 2004, she was a practicing social worker for 25 years. Research interests include ethics in social work practice and the impacts of neoliberalism and diversity on professional ethics. She has published a book entitled Paradoxes in Social Work Practice, Mitigating Ethical Trespass, as well as a website on ethics as well, which is ethicsinthehelpingprofessions.socialwork.dal.ca. The Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada shortlisted Dr. Weinberg in 2008 as the top new researcher in Canada, and she was awarded a senior fellowship at Durham University in 2017. So before I turn it over to her, there's a couple of housekeeping issues I'd like to mention. The webinar presentation will be approximately 50 minutes, followed by a 10 to 15 minute questions and answer period that I'm going to moderate. Please note that all the details you need, like how to access the slide deck and other resources, how to get your certificate of, of attendance, which is always important, and other housekeeping information is found at the bottom of your screen. All the widgets can be accessed by clicking the icons at the bottom of your window. You can also resize, move around any of the elements you see on your screen to customize your viewing experience. So take a moment and make the screen personalized for you. During the presentation, I encourage you to type in your questions at any time and I will compile them and then ask them at the end of the presentation. However, I'd like to mention one thing. Because we have so many people on today, we're encouraging participants to use the chat function for general comments about the presentation and the Q&A section for any questions related to the platform uh, or questions for the presenter. And this way we're going to try not to lose your questions and they won't get lost in the chat because there's just so many people on today. I think we have over 800 registered. So we want to make sure that uh, your questions get an opportunity to be shared and discussed. And with that, I am honored to pass on uh, the mic to our incredible presenter, uh, Dr. Melinda Weinberg. And so take it away. Thank you, and I'm delighted to be here and very honored to have been asked to do this presentation. And hello to all of you out there, including a bunch of names that I know, so that's very exciting. So I'm going to be sharing with you the results from a research study that I was part of. Um, and there were six themes that came out of the research, and we will be looking at differences and commonalities of practitioners around the world struggling with the ethical challenges of the pandemic. And from those themes, there were several that were of particular importance that I'm going to focus on. One is rights, needs, and risks for service users. One is about the exacerbation of inequalities that have resulted as, uh, from the pandemic. Another one has to do with the heightened emotions that everybody experiences as a result of living through this very difficult time and implications for us as social workers going forward. So next, I want to tell you a tiny bit about the research study, which was that it was a rapid collaborative research project between eight uh, social work ethicists around the world, and the International Federation of Social Work. We were looking specifically at ethics, which is issues of rights, well-being, social justice, and the avoidance of harm. And we were hoping to provide ethical guidance to social workers around the world about how to deal with the ethical challenges that came up during the pandemic, and also to try and influence employers and, govern and governments to create more effective and ethical 
opportunities for practice practitioners. So the study itself um, happened in May. It was an online survey where we were asking for what kinds of ethical challenges practitioners were experiencing. It wasn't just practitioners, it was also managers and, and students who were in placement. So what kinds of ethical challenges were people experiencing and how were they dealing with it? The study went out in nine different languages and we had 607 responses in a little over a week, which gives you some indication of just how stressed people were and how many ethical challenges they were struggling with. 54 countries, and I'm proud to say that Canada had the largest response of, of 78 responses um, to the survey. It was all, there were also interviews for people who specifically asked for an interview after the survey. And, and so what I will be following with are the results of the survey and quotations from around the world in terms of the kinds of ethical challenges people were struggling with. So there were six major themes that came out of the research. The first one was the difficulties of maintaining and, in fact, creating um, good, solid foundational relationships in the pandemic because people were either operating by phone or on the internet. Here we are, right? You don't get to see my face. We're, we're, not in a, we're not in an auditorium. And that in addition to that, people were also having to, in lots of situations, try to be creating those relationships when they were wearing PPE. The second major theme that came out of it was how, from an ethical standpoint, do you prioritize user needs and demands when they are, more, they are greater as a result of the pandemic, they may be different as a result of the pandemic, but also at the same time, resources are being stretched and that when you're trying to um, operate in terms of assessments, you may not have the same access to really a full assessment. As a result, trying to figure out how to balance service user needs and rights and risks also when there are a broader number of people whose health and well-being you need to be taking into account, including that of the social worker themselves, makes a really more complex kind of situation in terms of, of ethical challenges. As a result, often practitioners were wondering how or could they follow the policies, the procedures, the laws that were existing or that might have been brought into being just as a result of the pandemic or whether they needed to be bending the rules or using their own professional discretion because the policies seemed to not to work in terms of what they needed to do. All of these kinds of struggles led to tremendously increased emotional distress, fatigue, and the need for self-care. As a result, one of the things we were hoping for was what can we learn from this pandemic in terms of how to rethink things in the future? So those are the themes, and what we'd like to do now is give you a minute to um, just do this quick poll of have you found that COVID-19 has changed your practice? Yes, no, or maybe. And we're going to give you um, just a minute to respond to that. Okay, um, the results of the poll is that 94% of you said that it had in fact changed your practice, 2% of you said no it hadn't, and 5% of you said maybe. So that's a pretty staggering statistic, I would say. 
And what I'd like to do now is turn it over to you for a second before I get into the results from the survey, because it'll be interesting to see whether some of the same issues arise, which is for the 95% of you that said it had changed your practice, I want you to think specifically about ethical challenges you've experienced, and if you're willing to share any of those, and also if you've learned anything from these challenges that, would, that you think would be useful for the other participants today to, to hear about. And I'll give you a minute to respond to that. I see confidentiality has already come up, and um, balancing needs. Oh, problems with consent. Yes, that was one that came up. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh. Online services, wearing masks. So some of the things I've already identified, not having a work telephone, privacy, financial barriers. Work, difficulty working with the disabled. Okay, I'm going to come back to that one. A lot of you are identifying technology and, and confidentiality, meeting the needs of children with complex needs remotely. Okay, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, more difficult to build rapport, absolutely. You're bringing them in so fast, I'm having trouble even responding to any of this. But what's fascinating of what, what you're identifying is how much this is reflective of what we found around the world in terms of the kinds of issues. Um, not being clear about the well-being of a client when closing a session. Okay, interesting. The whole problem of building rapport was a significant one that we found in the study. Um, the problem of funding, more medical model, others deciding what is necessary, yes, so not recognizing the value of what social work is providing. Isolation, no question. Isolation in terms of our own work and isolation for service users. Um, uh, the learning curve of technology, oh my gosh, yes. And absolutely increased risk. I'm sorry I'm not responding to all of you, but there's so many of you bringing wonderful things up here. I hope you're, I hope you're catching some of it. And I don't know, Joan, if you want to jump in in terms of any of this, or it's just too, there's too much happening too fast here. Well, I okay. think it's a couple of things. I don't know if you can hear me, but um, the question and answer is, Okay, on questions and answers, people are also commenting about informed consent, working with those who are deaf, unable to meet in language, uh, uh, assessment of body language, not able to meet in person. So those types of things certainly have been discussed, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, I think you're going to find that in terms of our research results, and we're talking about around the world, the kinds of things that you folks have been identifying were absolutely present throughout the research. So I'm going to turn back to it now and, and share with you what we came up with. And you can see how it dovetails with your own experiences. So, and I'm going to say something about, I've included a lot of quotes, but I'm not going to be reading all of these quotes. Um, but what I tried to do was provide um, a scattering kind of around the world in terms of the 54 countries that contributed. And in many of the slides, I've made sure to add specifically Canadian quotes of experiences that people were having. So I, I, at first, I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes on the regional differences, because mostly we found that the similarities across incredibly different countries was amazing. But I do want to address a little bit the regional differences. Um, and again, they're not necessarily completely different, but they're more of degree. 
So, for example, culture and religion was a significant one in, in some countries more than others, although, of course, culture and religion is a, a factor here in Canada. But, for example, looking at Pakistan and the participant who said that many older people are illiterate and they don't accept the existence of COVID-19, they regard it as fake news, well, we won't go to what happened in terms of the election today uh, in the United States, but, but they're floating the lockdown, okay? And so it isn't obviously just Pakistan, U.S. being another pretty strong example of it. But that for the practitioner, the issue was that because there is respect for the elderly, how to be humble and working with them when not necessarily on the same page in terms of a, of a response around, around the pandemic. The type of political and social welfare regime absolutely influenced what, was, what people experienced in terms of ethical challenges. There was also different balances of the service provision for state, private, and non-governmental organizations. And the role in different countries was quite significant at times in terms of what social workers were required to do. So for in China, they might be responsible for the lockdown. In Nigeria, one participant was talking about using their own ATM to withdraw money so that a family member could pay for the hospital services for somebody in their own family. And so that's not the kind of thing that you would likely find happening here in Canada. The other kinds of differences, um, particularly in Asian, Latin American, and African countries, was there was much more social and community development work happening. Um, as I said already, there might be involved in, in actually implementing the lockdown. Um, and while we may feel like we're not necessarily properly respected in terms of Canada, it's much more significant as a problem in other countries. And again, while we may also struggle around poor internet connection and, and difficulties around digital working, in some countries having it at all is, is, is next to non-existent. But now I want to turn to the similarities um, across countries. And the first one, and you've already identified a lot of that in terms of the chat, um, balancing service user rights, needs, and risks. And what would have in the past been seen as regular everyday activities are now all of a sudden potentially risky activities um, that social work have to figure out how to manage from an ethical standpoint and still provide appropriate service to um, the, the people that they're serving. Um, again, deciding whether or not to follow policies, whether to breach the guidelines or the governmental things or to, to follow them. And this was a struggle across the world. So I was fascinated that one participant in Canada talked about having made up their own electronic communications consent form, and it's interesting because a number of you um, were talking about um, issues of consent, and one, one participant actually said they made up their own because they just didn't feel that the server they were using was necessarily secure and wanted in some way to sort of cover for that. Um, and also, it's how do you practice professional ethical wisdom in the kinds of struggles that people were dealing with? And so often people felt like they needed to use their own discretion or bend the rules in order to really meet the needs of service users. Um, one of the most significant, from my perspective, things from an ethical standpoint that's happened as a result of the pandemic is that we work with the most marginalized of people. And one of the things that's happened as a result of the pandemic is that those inequities have become even more pronounced, partly because of a loss of vital services. 
So there have been a reduction in social services. Things have closed down. Health services have been moved more to deal with the pandemic, and so other kinds of health needs have taken a back seat. Um, in lots of places, schools and daycares have closed, and in a place like the U.S., for example, there are special um, programs of providing what for some children might be the only square meal they get in the day, and when schools were closed, it meant that those children weren't getting even that one meal a day. So there were increased food insecurity all over the place as a result of the economic toll this has taken. Um, social isolation, which came up in terms of the chat, and you're identifying the kinds of isolation both for ourselves, but certainly for the people that we're working with, and, and loss of transportation. So loss of vital services was a key component of what happened as a result of the pandemic. Also, there was increased risk. So, and, and you've identified some of that again in the chat, that because of the limits of remote assessment um, and electronic things, you can't necessarily know um, how what's happening or you can't you're not you're not necessarily on top of things in the same way you'd want to be so uh, in a number of places the issue of um violence against women domestic domestic violence was really significant of people being afraid uh, practitioners being afraid that, for example, a woman might be talking to them on the phone and they wouldn't necessarily know if the perpetrator was in the room and whether the person who was on the phone was able to be honest about what was going on. Also, there's been an enormous effect in terms of the, as a result of the isolation with increases in concerns about suicide, addiction, violence, child abuse, what didn't come up in the study was homicide, but I think all the things that are going on around the world in terms of the increase of, of um, uh, terrorist attacks and, and that sort of thing, I think is in fact related to the pandemic. But that's, that's not a research response. That's just <laughs> my take that it's one more effect that's happened as a result of the pandemic. Also, there are differential impacts as a result of these increased inequities that because of race, we know that it's had a, a differential impact, on, uh, 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 certainly age and the number of people in homes for the elderly and the impact on them. We've seen socioeconomic status and people who were just clinging to financially and you know have lost their homes and lost their livelihoods. Gender, we know it has had a, a differential effect on women, being an essential worker, and, and anybody who's had poor access to health care. So those disparities have continued and worsened. And I noticed that in the chat that somebody talked about um, people who are deaf or with hearing impairments, and one of the quotes from the study was that clients with hearing impairments are at a significant disadvantage because they cannot read lips when healthcare providers are wearing masks. And the other one I want to identify is the indigenous communities and the impact on them, um, the lack of clean water and the lack of resources in terms of, of um, technology. So as I had said in terms of the outline for the presentation, this has led to enormous increase in the negative emotions that, that social workers are struggling with, whether it's helplessness, whether it's anger, whether it's grief, um, whether it's frustration and disappointment in terms of the lack of um, responsiveness of employers. There's been a whole range. And in Canada, one of the participants said, I deal with guilt feeling not altruistic because, of course, you have to take your own self-care into account in a very different way under these circumstances, loneliness and confusion. The issue, however, in terms of as, as social workers 
is that our capacity to understand our emotional states and those of others, but also to regulate them, is a crucial factor in terms of do it, providing good service. And as a result of that, people were really stressed about the fact that they knew, knew they needed to manage their emotions, um, but also that they were having such an increase in terms of negative emotions. So, for example, one participant in Canada said, one of my major issues was whether I could contain space for my clients that were grieving while I was experiencing my own loss. This was a practitioner who lost somebody as a result of the pandemic. And in Spain, another worker said, the big ethical challenge is to prioritize others over your fear and to forgive yourself for feeling that fear. So this was a really significant issue for people across the globe in terms of dealing with the pandemic. There are ethical dimensions to emotions because they often indicate for us, they become kind of a red flag that indicates the fact that there are ethic, there's an ethical dilemma operating and they can be an important tool in ethical deliberations. However, because the the sort of traditional approach to ethics has been to focus on codes of ethics and decision-making models, we don't give a lot of credence to the importance not just of cognitive responses to what's going on, but actually to emotional responses of what's going on. And I think that it's really important that we bring the the ethical dimensions of emotions back into our deliberations about what's happening. One of the key emotional struggles that people were having, which is referred to as moral distress, and it comes originally out of the nursing literature, is the concept of moral distress, which is when practitioners feel like they know the right thing to do, but they believe that their options are limited due to structural constraints. And if ever there was a period of time where we are operating within major structural constraints, this is it. As a result, I want to raise a concept that for me has been really important, and it's the concept of ethical trespass. This was a concept that originally came from, H from Hannah Arendt, who's a famous philosopher, and it was picked up by another political philosopher by the name of Melissa Orley. And she talked about the harmful effects that result from our participation in social processes, not because we are evil or have evil intent, but because of the role that we play and that what we end up having to decide on a day-to-day -day basis may at times have harmful effects that we did not anticipate. So, for example, in Ireland, one of the participants was talking about that she was not able to go to a home to properly evaluate for a potential adoption. And the worker said, this is not an experience I want to repeat, yet I expect I will do just that. So knowing that this may cause harm, that you may make an inappropriate or inaccurate a evaluation about an adoption, but not really being able to do anything about that because of the structural com constraints as a result of the pandemic. In Italy, a worker had to place an elderly person in a retirement home that ended up becoming a hot spot. And the worker said, I continue to think that that decision could be a tragedy that I would never forget. So we will be engaged in ethical trespass, not because we are evil, but because of where we are um, positioned in society of having to handle and, um, and, and manage all the varying needs, risks, and demands that are amplified as a result of the pandemic. Before I suggest that it was 
it's all negative doom and gloom, I do want to identify that there were positive emotions that people identified in, in the research. There were times when people felt pride and relief and excitement and absolutely hope that one of the things that going through any kind of crisis and crisis theory suggests this is that it opens up the possibility for us to come out of this the other side with things improved and with a better world as a result of it. So in Lithuania, um, a worker was responding to a sexual assault of a teen and felt that they had done a great job and that it was very rewarding. And um, it, and throughout, there were people who talked about feeling that despite all of what they were struggling with, they had managed to do something significant under these particular circumstances. So what needs were identified as a result of the pandemic? The need for more investment in social care and social and community development. I think in Canada, we've kind of fallen behind in terms of putting emphasis around community development. And yet, I think it's been, and in some countries, it was a major way in which people coped with what was going on. The weaknesses as a result of the neoliberal environment that puts the emphasis on efficiencies and economies over providing a social safety net for the most marginalized has really come to the fore as a result of the pandemic. That we need to have and recognize the importance of community-based and voluntary support networks, which have been absolutely essential around the globe in terms of getting through the pandemic. That, and this is no new story. It goes back to Flexner and the, and the beginning of social work. But there needs to be recognition of the role that social work has played because it isn't often perceived of as an essential service, and yet in many, many places it has been and that there has to be more emphasis on cooperation and coordination between services. What are the implications for us in the future? Greater need for respect and visibility, and that we absolutely need to counter some of the effects of managerialism. Um, that we have a, a, a role to play and we can contribute in providing and helping around relevant and appropriate guidelines, and that we may be needing to redesign social policies to engage much more with the social justice um, factors that plague so many of our, uh, social, so our service users. I think there are some lessons to be learned. We, we've highlighted the erosion of the social safety net and the gaps in services. And so, for example, in Quebec, a practitioner said, in my opinion, the major impact experienced in the CHLDSs, which are the residents for seniors, of the coronavirus is related to the abandonment of investments in the 15 years preceding the current government. And I think that's been true in many, many of our own provinces. So for example, in Ontario, um, the, the, the high percentage of deaths in, in, in nursing homes and in seniors' residents, similarly in Nova Scotia, in many of the provinces. And I think that at least the premiers are starting to recognize, well, and in fact, even on a, on a, a federal level, there's a recognition that we need to do something about that as just one small example of the erosion of the social safety net and what's happened and how it's been brought to the fore as a result of the pandemic. I really love this quote, and in a way, I'm coming to the end because I want to make sure we've got lots of time for discussion. So this particular quote was, we will learn much from this global crisis, how to prepare better in the future, how to better recognize the contributions of our healthcare professionals, how to better use virtual clinical communications, how to encourage staff members to remain committed and implicated, and how to care for all people better, or will we? And I think that really remains to be seen. So recommendations for policy and practice that came out of the research. 
that social workers need to rethink how we apply our values and our principles in new, pers- in new contexts, and I would say, and bringing in emotions as an important tool in our deliberations. That social work employers need to ensure that, that practitioners and students on placement are supported because isolation, which came up in your chat, it was one of the things, and the fact that people did not feel supported was a huge issue in the research. National Professional Association, so here we are, CASW, has a key role in drawing attention to the systemic factors that put populations at risk and the vital role of the social safety net in our, in our world. And governments need to recognize the role that social work plays in um, providing support to our most marginalized in our communities. There have been a number of publications that have come out of this study. I'm only going to identify three of them, and I think um, maybe some, Joan, you can, you can um, help me about this. I think one of them may already be available to folks that are participating in this, but this was the report that came out of the research. It is on the International Social Work I sorry, sorry, International Federation of Social Work website, and it was, it's the report from which I've made this presentation, although I have focused, of course, more on the Canadian context. We also have had a, um, an article published already in International Social Work, and it's called Practicing Ethically During COVID-19. And I have recently submitted something to the Canadian Social Work Review, which has not been published at this point, but I wanted to tell you about it uh, because I'm pretty sure it will be published. And it, it's looking specifically at Canada and the exacerbation of inequities as a result of COVID-19. So um, I'm going to come back to the questions in one minute, but I'm going to jump ahead to one thing because I just want to tell you who was in the research partnership these were the these were the first eight names were the social work ethicists around the world that were part of this particular research project, and then there were two people from the International Federation of Social Work who contributed um, enormously to our, our research process. So I'm going to go back now and throw it open to you and Joan. I'll have you manage this in terms yes. of comments, questions lessons learned, or anything from my presentation that you'd like me to address? Well, we've got lots of comments, Merlinda, so I'm going to toss some things out to you for your response okay. and thoughts, okay? So the first one was uh, a comment that was made that seems during the pandemic, the only the only people who are recognized for working hard were doctors and nurses. So we're talking then about, I guess, the, the whole piece around the role of social workers and that social workers weren't considered front frontline workers in some places. So do you have any thoughts about that? Um, I think that's accurate, and that was certainly what came out of the research around the world. I mean, I, I think that we as a profession don't do a great job of blowing our own horn, but I also think that it, it goes back historically right to the very beginning of the social work profession and the question from um, um, Flexner who was saying, are we really, a, you know, a sort of a, a real profession? I think we need to do more PR, I, and um, I think that whether it's CASW, whether it's the International Federation, but I think even on the local level. So, for example, at Dalhousie University, which is where I'm a professor, um, we had a couple of people on the faculty, including our fabulous um, placement coordinator, who, who put together a film that was looking at how does the community understand social work, because I think it's a very skewed perspective. You know, it's like we're, we take away children, basically, is what it amounts to, and interviewed people on the street and then provided a corrective experience in terms of what social work is about. It's a wonderful film, but I think we need to be doing that all over the place because we are, I think, in many, many situations, essential workers, and I absolutely agree with you. That has not necessarily been how we've been understood um, in, in, in these times. 
Absolutely. Um, actually, the video that you mentioned was done by Cindy Hall at Dell. Yes. I got yes. an opportunity to see it before it came out. It was it's amazing. It's a really well worth the um, the watching. It's an excellent uh, video presentation about how people see social work and help and what we do. So really, really helpful. Okay. Um, the next question is talking about about your research, the research that, and I guess future opportunities. Um, people are hearing about a lot of stories about losing certain staff, such as accountants. Their roles have been forced onto not-for-profit social work leaders. And that creates, they feel, a significant ethical issue of being expected to do things that social workers were not trained to do and are not within the scope of the roles we were hired for. So is this going to be part of uh, this research or will it, do you think it'd be part of research in the future? Just some thoughts on that, Merlinda. Uh, it's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know that I'm going to be involved <laughs> in doing the research. <laughs> um, you know, this one just about did me in on top of what I've had to do to manage uh, going online platform and all the rest of it. Um, but I think it's a very, very interesting question, and I think it, it's, it, and it certainly raises significant ethical questions. And I think some of it is pushing back and saying no, you know. And of course, it's easier said than done. Sometimes you can push back, and sometimes you can't. Um, but I do think we need to, to be holding the line, and that that was a theme throughout in terms of the research. So it's Absolutely. a very interesting question, but I don't. I, don't look to me for this one, <laughs> probably. I mean, I probably got another two years worth of papers that I can come up with from the research we've done so far. <laughs> oh, my. Which is great. Um, someone's asking about, uh, you know, and I think you've kind of alluded to it, the whole idea of doing research is really important in social work. And depending on where you are in the world, there may not be that, that much research. So do you have any suggestions in terms of increasing uh, research in social work? or how people could get involved, those types of things? Oh, how interesting. I, I think that it's one of the areas in which as a profession we have not done well. And I think it may relate to the earlier question about the fact that we're not seen as, as professionals. Mm -hmm. I, and I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody. When I was a practitioner and when I first entered the field, I couldn't have cared about research. And now I understand that it is a major way in which we further knowledge mm -hmm. and that if we have a particular perspective, which I think we do, that's both very unique and very necessary in our world, we need to be doing the research. And so um, it can happen in agencies. You can, you can partner with, with, with um, people who are doing research. You can, um, I mean, that's a major way. And in fact, I, when I first started in the field, my absolute very, very, very first job was working with the Y on a research project that they were doing and going out and interviewing people in the community. Um, and so I think it can be done on very small scale and it can be done on very broad scales. And I think it absolutely should be happening, not just in the universities, which is where it's primarily happening, but also happening, um, generated um, by social work practitioners. So that would yes. be one of the ways that I would encourage, you know, moving more towards uh, research and, and, and the importance of it. Yeah, I think it goes hand in hand too. That so, as social workers, we tend to be doers, right? Yeah. And our big priority yeah. is making sure that clients' needs are met, which is really important. But I, I think sometimes it doesn't leave us with a whole lot of opportunities to engage in research. So you're, I think it's valid, certainly valid, what you just said. Yeah. And I yeah. think Joan, to to pick up on what you're saying, I think one of the stressors uh, and and the ethical challenges is how do you balance. Um, right. the needs of practitioners, I mean, the needs of, of, of service users when we're so stretched anyway with putting in these kinds of things. I think it's absolutely um, one of the struggles. And, in fact, I've written a paper about it because we're expected to do self-care. We're expected to be managing and being altruistic and putting our own needs last. And yet our the need for research then ends up being sort of at the bottom of the barrel 
and yet I think it would both change um, how we were viewed as a profession and also would contribute to, I think, a more socially just world. Yeah, absolutely. We have so many good questions. I don't know if we're going to get them all, but I'm going to try my best. Um, someone actually mentioned, and I think what your thoughts about this, how the uh, whole pandemic has impacted social work students and placements and opportunities to interact with families, clients, those types of things. Yes. And in fact, I did not address it at all in the presentation, but we did have a number of students around the world who responded to it. Um, mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the research that we did. And I think that it's very problematic. The reality is students who are living through the pandemic, have ha it has impacted on what is feasible for them to do in terms of their placements. And I think that there, there are ethical questions actually about graduation and have they had the kinds of opportunities that they need to have had. At the same time I'm saying that, on the other side of the spectrum, the reality is, I mean, unfortunately, people are talking more and more about the fact that, that, that it, I don't want to scare anybody half to death, but they're not necessarily feeling that COVID-19 is the last of what we're going to have in the way mm -hmm. of pandemics. And so learning how to manage and learning how to provide service under the experience of a pandemic has some unique positive educational possibilities, um, even while there are other things that may have been truncated and may not have been as positive for students. But one of the things that came up um, in terms of a theme for the students in the research was feeling both that they didn't have the same opportunity around relationship development, mm -hmm. but yeah. also that everybody was so strung out and over the top that they weren't getting the kind of supervision and support that they felt that they would have had under other circumstances. And that seemed, that seemed to be an, an, a theme that came up in the research. Yeah, it's interesting too because people have commented in uh, the, the, some of the statements here that not only has it been very difficult in terms for clients, but also for people who are still working because their access to their regular supervision, social work supports has really uh, been impacted by the fact that you may be in the office one day, but you may not see another coworker, right? No so, question. No question. Yeah. The theme of isolation, not just for service users, but this, but of isolation as practitioners and social workers, whatever. I mean, it wasn't just the practitioners. I keep saying practitioners, but we had managers who responded to us. We had administrators respond to mm -hmm. us. We had students respond to us. And across the board, people were talking about the sense of isolation and not having the same kind of supports and opportunity for the kinds of consultation that in fact are essential, especially when the ethical challenges are ramped up. So, you know, with, it was like this double, double dilemma, which is you don't have the same opportunities for the kinds of consultation you need at the same time that there's more of a need than usual. Absolutely. And as well, from people who do do childcare and daycare closures, social workers not being able to work as well because of their own caring for their own families as, oh, as well. No, yes, yes. And, mm -hmm. Or trying to do their work in the home when they're yes. dealing at, with, with childcare issues, elder yeah. care issues, all sorts of issues. And again, balancing all of those needs. Yeah. Um, one question that's been coming up here, Merlinda, is do you think there's a risk that the pandemic experience will encourage employers to replace virtual contact with actual face-to-face -face contacts with clients as a cost-saving measure? Yes, I do. That's yeah. the short answer. And I think that's one of the things we're going to have to push back against because I think it would be a cost-saving measure and so that part of what would need to come from, from, from social workers is the ways in which it's inadequate, the ways in which it can be helpful, for example. Mm -hmm. So, for example, people in remote com communities, it may be the best that can be offered, but I think we're going to need to push back. I think that's a real danger that's going to come out of the, the, uh, the results of the pandemic. Yeah, and I agree with you because your earlier um, comments when you talked about that social workers are not very good at 
you know, uh, promoting and advocating, you know, for ourselves. Um, I think that's very true. And I think it ties into that, that people having a misunderstanding. I always used to say, would you, would you say that anyone can be a doctor? No. <laughs> so exactly. clearly, right? So we have yeah. a unique set of skills and knowledge, but I think because quite often we, we focus a lot and rightly so in terms of, of helping clients and families in our communities. We just don't uh, put enough time into that other piece. But I hopefully, I think that there are some strategies that will be coming up actually over the next few months that will be really helpful in that er whole area across the country. So stay tuned for some of those things. Excellent. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> so someone has asked us, this is a great question, um, how can we as a profession learn from this pandemic and be better prepared for possible future pandemics? Because you just alluded, it, it would be kind of naive yeah. to think that this is just going to be the one time ever since the Black Plague this has happened, right? Well, no, in fact, SARS, when we, when we yes. went through SARS and when we went through Ebola, the scientists mm -hmm. were talking about there are going to be more and more of these because, this is a bit of a departure, because the, the animal world is encroaching more on the human world because we're destroying their habitats. And, and they think that the pandemic, that COVID-19, was the result of bats being in the marketplace in yes. China. And they say there's going to be more of that because as the habitats for ha animals disappear, there's going to be more and more crossing over between animal worlds and human worlds in ways that we may not be able to manage. So I don't think it's over for us, folks. I, I'm no. sorry to be saying that, but I do think that that's a possibility. And so I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> oh, okay. Hang on. Now I have to go back here now. <laughs> we go. I'm, I'm reading ahead. How can we as a profession learn from this pandemic and be better prepared for possible future pandemics? Well, I mean, I hope that one of the things we've learned is how we can utilize virtual kinds of things, mm -hmm. but also the recognition of the gaps in the social safety net and putting pressure on governments to and and uh, you know to to do something about that and not allow it to slide again. I think there needs to be pushback against the, I mean, I'm an old lady. I started in a period where there really was a social safety net and it has eroded and eroded and eroded as more and more emphasis has been put on um, economics and the bottom line. And I think that as a profession, we absolutely have to be pushing back around that. And, and I think that's a major thing we need to learn from this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm going to try and do as many questions as possible, Merlinda, but I know that our, our time is, is going to run out eventually here. Um, someone has asked a question about, um, they've been asked to supervise a social work student, but they're working remotely. So they said, I've agreed, but with within limits. So what do you think about that? I guess there are a lot of questions and concerns think, about student placements, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's the best we can do. I think that it's better than nothing. And I think just even being aware that it's not as good as face-to-face -face is, is a, 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 an important factor in terms of somebody's recognition. But I think we need to be continuing to provide support to students and helping them get through placements because there's an enormous need out there. So part of it is the very fact that there's a recognition that it's not ideal, but it's better, the better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, someone's at, mentioned as well about uh, concern, but privacy commissioners have allowed leniencies for virtual care, which is really what we're into right now. Yeah. But what happens when this all ends and some, it will end. I know it will end at some point in time, but how to backtrack and then resume day-to-day -day care, day-to-day in-person care? Like how do we go back and and start doing that? Right. Yeah, and again, I guess I would say we have to push back. We have to say this was necessary under the circumstances, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not necessary and it's not the best way for us to go forward in terms of confidentiality, in terms of protecting people. Um, you know, we're, we're going to have to do a lot of advocacy and activism when this is all over. And part of the learning experience for me in terms of the pandemic is to know 
what are the themes that there's going to need to be that activism and, uh, um, mm -hmm. and advocacy about. And, and clearly, people in this audience are knowing what some of those themes are, that there's going to need to be pushback around. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And an overwhelming theme, too, that has come up in a lot of the, the comments has been around working in child protection and have the challenges that this has created in terms oh of children and parents not being able to have access, and as well in long-term care with uh, clients who are in residential homes not having access. And and I guess, do you have any thoughts about that in terms oh. of the... the and oh, I, that's a whole other topic, I know. It but. Was, well, it was, it was a huge theme in our research that came up both in terms of elder care and in terms of, of um, the child welfare system and the incredible stressors of um, n no respite for people, no mm -hmm. um, ability to really be doing adequate um, assessments, um, being worried about kids being in situations where there was so much stress that the likelihood of increased violence or um, uh, abuse, I, I mean, it, it was just everywhere in the research, uh, but sort of at both ends of the spectrum in turn. Well, any, any group that was marginalized, but child welfare came up a lot, and it absolutely came up a lot in terms of the elder care and, and the fact that, I mean, one, one that was just heartbreaking was um, a participant who was talking about um, uh, an elderly man who was in a residential setting who was given permission to leave. He went and went to McDonald's and had a hamburger, which was against the rules. He came back, and he was made to go into quarantine. He was so depressed that he, be, that he started talking suicidal ideation. And then, the res, and then the residents responded by saying that they were going to have him locked up. And so it just escalated and escalated. And the practitioner was trying to intervene because the practitioner had felt that the whole thing was an overreaction that had come from first isolation, not really understanding the implications of going and having a hamburger or whatever. Um, but, I mean, there was story after story after story that was just absolutely heartbreaking um, about both uh, the child welfare system and the elder care. One of the ones that, for me, just uh, stayed with me all the time, and this another one in Canada, was about social workers in a hospital setting who had been called in to talk with somebody who was interested in medical assistance in dying, that, that the woman knew that her days were limited and she did not want to keep living this way. They had to, first of all, she was in a ward. There was no confidentiality. Mm -hmm. They had to come in completely gowned up in PPE, and they couldn't see, she, the, the, the patient couldn't see their face. Um, she, they couldn't see her face. And the family, because of what was going on with COVID-19, could not be part of the discussion about medical assistance in dying and therefore didn't trust the decision that the patient had made that she wanted to have medical assistance in dying. And, I mean, it just, for absolutely everybody in that scenario, it was beyond horrendous in terms of the kinds of ethical challenges that practitioners were trying to deal with. Wow. It's so much yeah. to think about. And I, and I think earlier on you mentioned, and this isn't be my last comment before I, I turn it over to you for our, our wrap up, but it's very hard when you talk about all this that we talk about technology and talk about informed consent and the huge issues that we are, we really now have to address in terms of, um, electronic and informed consent and, and how we communicate and work with people. So it's just, a lot to uh, to to take, and I think that will be one long term um, uh, follow up from all of this Absolutely. for sure. No, yeah. no question about that. Yeah. So before we clue up, and I'm sure I, I'm sorry I didn't get to everyone, but I, I tried my best to do as many as possible. Um, just to remind you that. Um, 
if you look at your icons at the bottom of the page, um, there are the slides are there so you can download. Uh, there is the certificate completion icon as well. And uh, this presentation will be available to be to be seen again uh, for anyone who may have registered but due to work and that couldn't do it today. So that will be available. And I will ask um, Alexandra um, if she can find the link or the connect to Cindy Hall's video. Um, I know that I saw it at the CASWE conference about a, a year before last. So if we can find that link for you so you can see it, we'll happily do that. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Merlinda for you to wrap up your, your comments. This has been a wonderful presentation and I thank you so much. Well, it's totally been my pleasure, and I just, I mean, I was trying to watch the chat and the question and answers, and it was so heartening in terms of what you all are doing. Um, I, I wanted to know, and Alexandra, maybe you can answer this, whether also, if we're providing a link to Cindy Hall's film, is there a link to the report that from mm -hmm. which this this yes. presentation because I think we talked about that but I don't know what happened with that so I did want to uh, just find out about that before I say my final thank yous and goodbyes yeah yeah Merlinda great point um so anything like a link or anything you'd like for me to share with them I can or with attendees I can put into the handout section um so Merlinda you can email that to me and I can make sure that we add that into the handout section okay all right great so I want to say thank you to, for giving me this opportunity and Joan for um, you moderating it and Alexandra who was unbelievable and I'm sorry, I forget the name of the other person who was a rather tech person that Marissa. put me in such good hands, Marissa, <laughs> such good hands around doing this. And thank you to all of you participants because um, I, I've been trying to watch as I'm talking, you know, it's like r rubbing your head in your belly at the same time, um, to uh, some of the comments. And um, um, it seems as if this presentation is very reflective of your own experiences, and I want to wish you all the best for hanging in there through all of this. It will pass and hopefully we will learn something from it that will ultimately make for a better world. So many, many thanks, and I, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, everyone, and um, hopefully uh, you'll find some of the resources and comments and discussion today very helpful for you in your practice. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay, bye.